I want to reiterate, first of all, the, the, the point that Mary Liz made and others have made as well, that actually it is amazing to get such a diverse group of people together in a room talking about something like this. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, and it's a shame because obviously we all have very, very similar challenges that we're facing um, with different you know, perspectives on things. We have uh, different particular needs and so forth. But we do have really common challenges, when, especially when it comes to the digital. Uh, and one of the points I think that came out in, in each of the presentations was, was around the idea of, of the continuing professional development, the need for uh, training and upskilling of those who teach uh, at all levels in education. But I think it, it should go beyond that. I think it's not just those who teach, it's those who support learning, it's those who have any role whatsoever in the education or enterprise, including the senior managers, uh, many of whom uh, will admit, if you speak, uh, quietly with them and they don't have a microphone, that actually they perhaps could do with a bit of upskilling themselves, a bit of jargon busting is what most of us need, I think, from time to time because the pace of change is, is, is so rapid. Um, and I think also we, we've talked about the different frameworks that exist. There's lots of different frameworks out there. When we started to do all the board project, we were originally thinking about coming up with a framework for digital skills for higher education. But when we did our literature review and found that there were already over 60 plus pre-existing frameworks for digital skills, we thought the last thing we need is another framework. So why don't we do something a little bit differently? Why don't we think about the points that were raised by each of the three presenters? Think about the implementation now. We've got frameworks, we've got policy documents. The, the amount of research and work that's gone into those documents and into those policies is fantastic. It's really, really good. So we know what we need to do. But the big question that we haven't really answered yet is how do we actually do it? Yes, there's a myriad of things that were uh, explained and, and, and uh, described in the various presentations. But you know, for me, I think if we can think a little bit more about all of us being learners in this digital age, because everything is changing so quickly, that might help loosen things up a little bit. And if we can think about um, the, the aspect of confidence, because I think that's crucial. I think it's not just about being technically competent and being able to tick off a list of skills, but it's more about feeling confident, feeling to some extent that you're in a control in this environment and that you feel confident enough to make decisions about when to use technologies and when not to use technologies, that you feel that you can take a critical perspective on them when it's needed. And I think if the overall policy goal is about developing a creative and an innovative Ireland, then confidence is crucial to that. We can't be creative if we don't have the confidence to experiment and to try new things. So I, I just think that uh, those are interesting points that were implicit and sometimes explicit in some of the presentations. Um, I think when it comes to implementing, one of the things that appeals to people so much about digital technologies is that they can be fun. They can help boost creativity. You can play with them. So I think it would be the ultimate irony if we set out to develop sets of policies and training programs and frameworks and schemes that are really rigid and traditional to try and boost people's creativity and confidence in something which is inherently creative, adaptable, multimedia. So it would be nice, I think, if we could all think in all of our different sectors about perhaps slightly more imaginative ways in which we might go about this CPD. Right? The title itself, CPD, sometimes causes yawns, somebody preemptively yawn, dare admit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, we, we know, you know, I, could, I, I live in Galway. Galway is full of festivals and creativity and all sorts of things happening all the time. That's why I look so exhausted. So, I mean, can't we do that about CPD as well? About learning, about enjoyment? That helps with confidence as well. So I just wanted to chip those points in. Is that okay? Great. Well, we have a couple of minutes. Um, uh, anybody got any questions for the panel? Uh, we would have time just about for one, maybe two. But if not, I'm going to chip in some questions. Anybody? There's a gentleman here in the front, if we can bring the roving mic. This gentleman in the white shirt, and if you could identify yourself when the microphone comes to you, please. No, no, no not him. No, this, this gentleman here. Sorry. Sorry. 
Hi, thanks. Uh, Perry Sher from the Connacht Ulster Alliance. Uh, I was delighted to hear Kevin talking about copyright. Uh, I, I had a very free and easy approach to copyright until I found my own institution was printing off thousands of pages of a, of a book that I had edited and I changed my views considerably at that point. But I suspect that similar things are happening across virtual learning environments and digital uh, educational packages across the world, not just in Ireland. But in Ireland we don't really have any legislative or, or institutional protection for copyright or no efforts as far as I can see to to educate educators about copyright and intellectual property issues. So I don't know if any of you up there are aware of anything that is happening to move that thing along. If we could start with you, um, Kevin. I mean, like, do you, do you, are you aware of that as, a, as an issue in, in this digital framework, that not just the, you know, the copyright issue that's been raised there, but other legal frameworks, particularly that one of the things that you associate with digital is cross-jurisdictional? Sure. and where multiple uh, legal jurisdictions may apply? I mean, certainly the, 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 the forum, the National Forum's uh, uh, work on, on, on publication, forthcoming publication on policy certainly covers that, and that was the context I was talking about there, Perry. But I certainly know a lot of the librarians uh, in Ireland, Connell, and I don't know if there's any librarians here today that could talk more knowledge, knowledgeably about it, but I know they've had, had uh, certainly been trying to put in place uh, kind of, uh, uh, I suppose, both uh, from a CPD perspective, but also uh, that legis legislatively we would uh, certainly be much more aware of it. Obviously, with all funding now through the um, European uh, side of things, that anything that's being produced through the sector has to be open access rather than copyright. And there's been a big bash, backlash against publishers like Elsevier, etc., because of their, I suppose, their, their uh, I suppose, ownership of of, of, uh, of of so much of material that's produced through the, uh, uh, say, through the public purse. But I think uh, th there have been moves. It's primarily through the librarians, and they, I know, have also been talking with the uh, the national forum. So expect, I think, to see more in that space as as, as we start to address it more. Mary, if I can come to you. I mean, are you coming across any of these? And I, I know the question, as I said, was about copyright, but other areas where this, um, you know, a lack of legal clarity might be creating difficulties? Um, well, I know there's a huge amount of work going on, 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 and I might even ask Michael to come in on this a bit, on just developing the infrastructure for learning content, for, uh, content virtual learning environments, way, ways some people share. And, and, and one of the things we've come across is where people have developed material that you know well what's the ethical way and the professional way to actually you know set up a system where that kind of that can be shared and can be shared in a way that people are happy with and it you know you, you are meeting those requirements for open access you know because again i think it's challenging the traditional notions of, of how we how we you know MOOCs and all of these things are challenging our sense of you know who owns what you know, so I don't know, it just if Michael, because Michael is very much leading on it in, you know, just in terms of the, the whole area of learning content, just there. Sorry, Michael, to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. It kind of builds on what Kevin was saying. Within the further education and training sector, SOLAS has a central role in terms of putting a national infrastructure in place. So we have a program and, and learners uh, support system, uh, PLSS, and we have um, a kind of a central infrastructure. And part of th that infrastructure that we're building is, a, is about content um, content repositories and sharing. So one of the things that we're doing to override the, the copyright issues is to have licensing agreement with content suppliers. So we're buying in content rather than relying on content um, being developed within the sector. But for content developed within the sector, we have a workflow of content going through a, a peer review process to make sure that any of these intellectual property right issues are addressed before it becomes available to be shared with other people. Um, but I think it's something that we can do because of the way that we have these central systems in place that's not maybe in place in, in other sectors. But on the other hand, if you're the guy who's created something innovative, you want to make money out of it. I mean, like, how, how do you strike that balance? Yeah, I mean, the, the history of people, um, and Kevin would know about the national de repositories, um, people don't share things. It's, it's just human nature. People don't share things. But people will build things together. So if you can build communities of practice and get people to build things together, then things are shared automatically, and I think that's the secret. Okay, I'm going to take one more question from this gentleman here, and then we'll move on to the next panel. Uh, th thank you. Uh, my name is Rory O'Sullivan. I'm the principal of Calester College of Further Education, and I'm a member of the Dublin Regional Skills Forum. Um, while reference was made to resourcing earlier on, um, it, is a, it is key to everything. Like, you can have all the ideas in the world, but if you don't have the resources to implement them, that's fair enough. And like we, I've, my own place, we've been involved in virtual learning and blended learning since 2004. 
but it is not recognised, there is no recognition whatsoever in the staffing models. The staffing model from the Department of Education, I'm not, and this isn't a bash the department day, even though I'm up for that any other day. <laughs> um, is that it's basically 19 students, one teacher in a classroom that's shaped like a box. A teacher stands at the, bottom, at the top and everyone is um, like educational veal calves in rows. And that's the, that's the resourcing model. So there is no resource for digitalization, even though like all the strategies are, like nobody would disagree with a word of it, that's, that's perfectly fine and fair, but it doesn't work. Um, before I sort of moved from the classroom, I've been teaching computer science in schools since 1986, when they were using batteries and very big computers that didn't do much and all of that kind of thing. And the, computer, the money that came out of the department was to buy equipment. Okay, I'm delighted that Eddie is here and the, and the talk of all the CPD and all that. I think that's to be very, very much welcomed. But there is no, t there is no money out at all for maintenance. At the, mom at the moment, particularly after the last 10 years we've gone through, you're holding things together with baler, baler twine and sellotape. But what's actually happening is the amount of classroom money, classroom materials money that's been used to buy more baler twine to hold the computer together is exorbitant and actually what's actually happening now is we're running foul of procurement rules um, with the maintenance companies because we're spending so much on maintenance it'd be actually cheaper to buy new computers but we don't we can't do that for all the procurement rules so like resourcing is fine and it, you do need people like me to do it because it do, if it doesn't happen but what's actually happening is all the ideas are long since past the resourcing models to support them Okay, I'm only going to take an answer from uh, Eddie because, Eddie, you've got Department of Education and Skills on your title of your presentation today. And um, so um, you own it, Eddie. Tell us what you think. <laughs> well, I take it that the Baylor twine is virtual rather than real, you know. There are uh, days. There are days. <laughs> I, th I think we all accept that, you know, Ireland went through a fairly deep crisis over a period. And we're beginning to emerge from that. Budgets were cut, you know, and like it's uh, um, unprecedented, I suppose, when you think about cutting per capita payments to schools. And it's only that area I would know about. I don't really know much about the further education sector. Um, but I, I, I think we're on a bit of a, 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 an upward trajectory now where, you know, um, we're beginning to improve things. We're beginning to address things. I think there's a, an air of optimism about um, I think we're beginning to address challenges in the system, you know, PTRs, schools, equipment, that kind of thing that we might have been in the position to address, uh, you know, a number of years ago. It's all a question of priorities and, you know, you know the big kind of challenge for the department and for the system and for the, the society, you know, we have a, still a growing student population and that means more teachers and that will mean more schools in certain areas, parts of the country and that will have first call uh, you know along with certain other priority areas um, but I do think there is recognition in the system you know there is a 210 million commitment in the digital strategy um, a lot of that will go on equipment and we believe that that will address some of the fundamentals and you know there, there are, there are, we are aware of the reality our inspector tell us of what's happening in schools so um, I, I think, I think um, things will get better. Well, I think that's as good as a, close to a promise as you're going to get, I'm afraid. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our fourth module today. I'd like to thank our speakers, Eddie Ward, Mary Liz Trant and Kevin O'Rourke and Professor Ian McLaren for uh, bringing his uh, analysis to, to boot. Um, I'm going to ask our panellists to leave the stage and if you can just bear with us for two minutes while the next panel come up. Thank you.